Okay, everyone, it's time for us to move along to the arthropods. So remember, the arthropods is a rather large group, and we'll talk about who belong to this group. This is the most awesome group, though, when it comes to moving to land, especially during the Carboniferous that we'll start talking about, because this um, time period is when we had the age of the giant insects. So seriously, how cool is that? So the oldest evidence of arthropods to move to land would be about 400 million years ago. And if you happen to be curious where they're found, they're found in Scotland. So when it comes to these fossils, they include awesome creatures like wingless insects, we're talking centipedes, spiders, scorpions, all sorts of other interesting creatures. And once they actually moved to land, um, you know, life definitely became interesting. And so these were not the first multicellular critters on land, because remember that was the plants and the fungi. However, they definitely were the first animals on land. Don't forget that. Write that down. Add that to your timeline, okay? First animals to come to land were the arthropods. Now, what caused these guys to be so successful, um, so in the very beginning of, before you even listen to this lecture today, um, there was one video that had you um, watch, and it was discussing insects and how successful they are. And one thing that makes them so successful is the fact that they have what's called an exoskeleton or an external skeleton, okay? So the purpose of this is for protection, okay, as well as supporting them from a physiological perspective, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide. So the purpose of the exoskeleton, as I said before, was protection, okay? And so it was giving the arthropods some armor. So let's think, what were they trying to protect themselves against? Well, we know by now we had predator and prey interactions all over the place, okay? So that wasn't going to change just because they moved to land. So the whole purpose of the exoskeleton was to protect against physical injury, but also physiological stress, okay? So how this works is that um, the exoskeleton can kind of provide a barrier against changes in the environment that might be drastic. So... Um, you know, osmotic changes or ionic gradient changes or something along those lines. The whole purpose of the exoskeleton um, is, is to add some sort of control to keep it very, um, very similar on the inside so the animal doesn't have any issues, okay? Now, additionally, another benefit is strength. Okay, so for a given quantity of skeletal material, if you have a hollow tube, that's a lot stronger than a rod of material. Okay, so the exoskeleton definitely provided a lot of strength to the critters too. Now, just like every other system in the world, um, you know, the exoskeleton isn't necessarily perfect. And so the creatures couldn't just sit there and, you know, not move. So what had to happen then is the flexible joints. Okay, so in order for the animal to actually move around, they have to have flexible joints. Additionally, they had to have muscles that control different regions of the body. Now, what I'm wanting you to get from this particular figure is just to realize that by now we have flexible joints, okay, and we have muscles that are very distinct and they only control certain parts of the body. Another disadvantage of the exoskeleton is that eventually your insect is going to grow, okay, and so they're going to increase in size. Well, the skeleton is not able to grow with them, all right, and so what has to happen is they have to do what's called shedding the old one, and the name for that is molting, and once they molt, especially right afterwards, the animal is really vulnerable to something else coming along and eating it, okay? So, because it does not have that protection anymore. So, it's definitely not a perfect system. Now, eventually, the new skeleton will harden once the animal has molted, and then it's fine. Um, however, at least initially, the animal is in danger. And I can tell you, um, I run a general oncology lab in the fall, and we have had many experiments where we've had praying mantises before, and praying mantises molt. And if we've had them left over from experiments, very often I will keep them and raise them and try to have them live an interesting little life as much as they can, because um, we always do that with critters we use for experiments. And I've watched them molt, and I can tell you molting can be a really traumatic experience for insects. They're basically shedding their out outside layer. And unfortunately, um, sometimes if the conditions are not just right or something goes wrong, the insect will die. So molting is very traumatic and very stressful for the insects, but it's a part of what they have to do if they you know, continue to grow, which they all do. Another um, part of having 
um, arthropods and what they've had to do to evolve is they have what's called tagmosis. So tagmosis is just when they have specialization of different parts of their body that do particular functions. Okay, so the independent regions are called tagmata and it is spelled on the slide. Okay, but an example would be like the head and the thorax and the abdomen and so forth. Okay. Primitive arthropods had a relatively high number of segments and they all had jointed appendages. And what's interesting is that the diversity we see today is due to the specialization of different segments. And again, we've talked about this before, but it probably became, it came around because of the Hox genes that we have all these different insects, which is pretty awesome. So whether we realize it or not, insects are actually the most successful group of critters on the planet. So if you guys are grossed out by insects, I hate to say it, but one out of every three species is an insect. And believe it or not, there are more species of beetles in the world than there all are of all vertebrates. So they are everywhere. And they are a fascinating group from an evolutionary perspective, especially when we start talking about the giant insects that existed in the Carboniferous. I'm telling you, if you make a time machine, be careful where you go. <laughs> now, if we step back a second and look at how insects evolve from sort of a broad perspective, okay, so there are five major adaptation events that um, resulted in the expansion of populations that did better, okay, and reduced the more number of individuals with the more primitive form. So basically, we started out with wingless insects. Okay, then wings evolved and you might each step of this, by the way, I'd like you to think about what um, evolutionary benefit having these traits would be. Okay, because I'm going to ask you this again. Hint, hint. Did I mention I'm going to ask you this again? Hint. <laughs> Write this down. Okay, so we go from wingless to winged. Well, that benefit is pretty obvious. Okay, escaping predators, all sorts of interesting things. Then we would go to folded wings. Okay, so what I want you to consider is what would a benefit be of folded wings, okay? Then eventually metamorphosis would evolve, okay? So what I want you to consider is what's a benefit of metamorphosis, and we kind of said that in a couple slides ago. Then we get to having a hardened pair of first wings, okay? And then what really probably led to the success of the insects was being able to have them diversify along with flowering plants. So I know it's a little bit early in the season now, and we briefly covered angiosperms last time, but what I want you to realize is the reason angiosperms produce flowers at all is to attract an insect pollinator. Okay, so all those traits of those pretty colors and the nice smell, um, at least initially before the horticulturalists came along, the purpose was to attract the insects, okay? And what's even more interesting is that, for example, hummingbirds prefer red flowers. So if you see a lot of red flowers, they're trying to attract hummingbirds. Um, bumblebees and so forth and, and those type of insects tend to prefer nectar over visual cues like color. So if you see white plain looking flowers, a lot of times their pollinator is just going to be bumblebees or something along those lines. So just something to keep in mind once flowers do eventually come out, <laughs> which I can tell you in my gardens right now, all I have are crocuses, but I'm taking what I can get. Um, uh, but just to look for that. And the next time you see a flower, Keeping in mind, humans have messed with this an awful lot, um, but the next time you see a flower, consider what pollinator the flower, the plant, might have been trying to attract. So the story of insects begins about the Middle Devonian. Okay, so this is when the Earth's forests were growing. This is when springtails, um, is what these little critters are called down here, would first make their appearance in the fossil record. So what I want you to notice, they don't have wings, but they do have segments and tegmata and all the other things that we, you know, tend to use um, to describe some of those primitive insects. So as you would expect, these are the early guys. And they weren't super fancy, but they were still pretty cool. Now, during the Carboniferous, this is when swamp forests would become prevalent, and we said that last time um, during our plant lecture. And this is when the winged insects would appear. Okay, so we're talking about the first dragonflies, the first mayflies, and the first cockroaches. And so again, thinking about what the benefit is with having wings, well, you can then, um, you know, fly away from predators, and you know, or potentially utilize new habitat. And I know everybody gets grossed out by cockroaches, and I hate to say it, but they unfortunately do quite well in the presence of humans because they're generalists, and so they can exist in so many different conditions. 
Um, you know, but back in the Carboniferous, these guys were huge. Okay. So the next time you see a cockroach, don't freak out. Just be glad that they're tinier than they were back in the day. Now, during the Permian, this is when stoneflies and true bugs and beetles and caddisflies and all sorts of interesting groups would come about, okay? So considering that they have folded wings, considering the fact a lot of them had that, that hard first covering, which the whole purpose is to protect the wings. Um, so you can definitely see how insects were evolving during this time, and they were getting more and more complex. So during the Triassic, this is when the oldest true flies would actually come about. Um, and then it would take the Jurassic as far as when the butterflies would make their fashionably late appearance. Okay. What I also want you to consider is it took until the end of the Cretaceous until all the familiar groups had appeared. Um, now when it comes to how insects did at the end of the Cretaceous, because remember there was that huge mass extinction that took out the dinosaurs, um, they didn't actually do all that bad. So they were relatively unaffected. And to be honest, insects have just been doing better and better with time. So, so we've said this before that our earliest insect lacked wings. And I want you to consider is that, um, when wings did come about, it was a really, really big event, okay? Because for insects, they would be the lords of the skies for hundreds of, you know, a hundred million years. And so, you know, it's pretty obvious to see why wings have been so successful. So w insects and wings, by the way, evolved during the age of amphibians and small reptiles. And so they were probably easy prey for these guys. The insects were easy prey for those guys. So having wings would be, um, you know, a definite advantage to being able to escape. What's interesting, though, is that the wings are a totally modified. They're not a modified structure like birds or bats where it's the arm. But instead, they're an entirely new structure. Okay. And so nobody's really sure how as far as like you know exactly how they evolved but give it some time and researchers will probably figure it out. So we mentioned earlier that metamorphosis um, evolved in insects and so before metamorphosis the way it would work is the eggs would hatch and then the tiny insect would look just like a smaller version of, an, of the adult and then it would molt and grow and grow. Okay, so metamorphosis, though, is much more drastic. So you start out as an egg, then you go to a larva, then you turn into a pupa, okay, and then out comes a butterfly. So think of butterflies or moths or something like that. So here's a question for you and something I'd like you to consider, okay? What would the benefit be of going through metamorphosis rather than just, you know, growing up and molting and then turning into a larger sized adult? Okay, and so the hint to this is that think about what the two different forms eat for metamorphosis versus what the tiny little insects versus the largest insects eat. Okay, so just something to keep in the back of your mind. So next, of course, we would have having that hardened forewing, as it's called. Okay, and then the hind wing folds up and tucks underneath. So the purpose of this is pretty obvious because those wings are really delicate. And so having that hardened protection over top, make sure that they don't get damaged. Okay, so now we get to what really benefited the insects probably the most, and that was their collaboration with angiosperms, okay? So remember that the angiosperms produce flowers, and the whole purpose of flowers is to attract insects, and, um, you know, plants are pretty amazing, and so they kind of... Um, know where they've been selected for, let's put it that way, um, to attract certain types of pollinators. And then if the idea is that you attract one pollinator and comes and pollinates and then gets pollen brushed all over them. And then as it flies to the next flower, it's going to fly to a similar looking flower, hopefully one of the same species that it can then pollinate. And then it can spread its pollen and produce seed. And that's the ultimate goal of of you know plants and reproduction so really the hypothesis is why the in, the angiosperms and the insects are doing so well because we've talked about this before they're the two biggest groups is probably because of their um, collaboration okay so hopefully before lecture you watched one of the videos I had asked you to watch and now I'm gonna have you watch a different video okay because again it's one thing for me to talk about this stuff um, but the video I'm gonna have you watch after lecture now it just does a really nice job to kind of summarize everything and you know from up to a cert up to where we've been so far and give a little idea of where we're going now you don't have to watch the whole thing but definitely at least watch the first 20 minutes of it 
okay? And since lecture is kind of short, and I told you this before, that that's kind of the way the class is going, is that, you know, I talk about certain things, and it's really nice to be able to actually visualize and see them, because it definitely makes it stick, okay? So also don't forget, please get your um, quiz turned in ASAP. I'm going to spend time grading them over the weekend, and I want to see how you guys did, and that's going to determine, you know, kind of how we set up the exam, which will be a week from today. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful weekend and stay safe, and I'll talk to you again on Monday.